to me, it's kind of like the redundancy in physiology is always going to make things difficult. It's like people are like, oh, I think I'm targeting the glycolytic system or the oxidative system. And it's like, you're not like it's, it's too much of a, a jumbled up mess. And, and it's going to be a similar thing with hypertrophy where we'll discover like, you know, contingency plans and alternative pathways. And even the, the same pathway on a different person might operate from different signaling mechanisms or something along those lines. Welcome to the Upside Strength Podcast, your number one resource for all things fitness and performance in Switzerland. This is a special episode today that will be dedicated specifically to hypertrophy training. And to dive into this topic, I'm happy to welcome two returning guests, Evan Pycon and Pat Davidson. What's up, guys? Good. Looking forward to this. Uh, I'm excited. It's always, it's always nice to be able to do any kind of an interactive uh, session. And, um, you know, Evan, we haven't met each other before. And I, I know that you're really, really a smart dude and, and have really uh, insightful and well-stated thoughts. So uh, that's always great to be able to bounce some things off of somebody like that. Yeah, I've been looking forward to it as well. I know I'd actually listened to the podcast with the two of you on. I really enjoyed that. So I'm excited to get a chat with both of you at the same time. Yeah, so, so how come you guys have never actually crossed paths considering you guys have so many people in common? <laughs> Man, I, yeah. I work in New York City and I don't cross paths with people that work 10 streets down the road from me that are great. <laughs> so, you know, you get into your own little habitual life and like, you know, I don't know, that's, that's the way I operate. Uh, so it's, it's, it just, I don't know, <laughs> who knows? Yeah, I was going to say, I feel like uh, just never a catalyst to make it happen. I mean, I'm sure we know, I mean, even me and you, Sean, we've talked a few times over the years, and it's two years later that we actually got to talk face-to-face, I think. Just take something kind of sparking that and making it happen. It's all just circumstance. Well, it's a pleasure to have you both on, that's for sure. And before we dive into the specific questions that I have, um, I thought it'd be interesting to have each of you take a few minutes to give you perspective on what is hypertrophy, how does it work so that we can establish kind of a common ground to work from? Who wants to take it first? I can do that. <clears throat> well, I mean, hypertrophy is the growth of, of tissue. It's change in, in volume and, and mass of, of any kind of tissue. It's uh, not specific to muscle tissue, skeletal muscle tissue. It could happen to fat tissue and certainly does, particularly in the Southeast corner of the United States. Uh, you know, it's, it's, seems to be based on some partitioning of nutrients and, and some sort of a surplus condition to be able to drive that phenomenon. Uh, what we're trying to do here is discuss the way that we can isolate skeletal muscle and be able to create some sort of a hypertrophy adaptation there. And, uh, you know, I think that what's, what's super interesting is it used to be, at least when I was being educated and doing my educating in a a collegiate setting, uh, it was straightforward. It was the hormone hypothesis. And the hormone hypothesis has really been debunked. And, and now we're sort of left uh, trying to discuss other, other sorts of signals that we believe are the primary mode by which uh, skeletal muscle goes through an enhanced protein synthesis process that leads to protein synthesis exceeding degradation and, uh, and yielding some sort of a a, 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 a result that's greater than where we started from. But I think that's kind of exciting where, where it was like an old model sort of gets tossed out and you know, maybe bits and pieces of the old model contribute, but, but overall uh, we're, we're in sort of a, an untapped frontier where we have an idea about some training methods that are probably better than other methods. But from a mechanistic standpoint, we, we really are, are not all that uh, solidified in understanding it. And that's fine because, you know, when you really get into uh, the research on, on muscle hypertrophy, it, it kind of dovetails with the research on cancer in a lot of ways in terms of what kinds of markers people are looking for. And, and, uh, and I don't know if people are aware of this, but cancer is really tricky. So if cancer is tricky, then skeletal muscle hypertrophy mechanisms are really tricky too. So it's a, it's just a, a, a cool topic where it seems like it should be very simple. I feel like some of the greatest minds in sports science and exercise science history have really loved this particular topic and devoted their whole lives to it. And, uh, and because it's sort of a singular variable, it's not like trying to figure out the science of developing a soccer player where there's like 27,000 different variables that probably lead to success 
for an athlete in that sport. We're just talking about one thing of like growing muscle tissue. And yet, even with this one singular thing and the amount of depth and the amount of resources that have gone into this process, we don't really have like a solid mechanistic explanation of this process. And anytime that there's lack of certainty and clarity, people can either take really a few different, uh, you know, approaches mentally, like they can be, you know, give up on it, or they can get excited about it and look at it from an opportunistic standpoint. And I usually choose to do the, the latter of the two. Sweet. Yeah. So just to add to that first, uh, threw some shade on the Southeast of the U S I'm in Atlanta right now. So hopefully you're not talking about me. Um, <laughs> from New York though so it's all good but yeah just to uh add to what Pat was saying yeah that's the really cool thing about hypertrophy like it's so damn simple I like our friend Dr. Ben House calls it just getting muscles more bigger because it's like we don't really know what's happening we know hypertrophy there's definitely some kind of increase in muscle volume or mass but even things as simple of are we adding fibers to the muscle we don't really even know that in most cases and we can't really study that either because generally people have to be dead to actually study that. You're not going to pull out all of someone's muscle fibers. We can't have um, someone do a training intervention, look at a before and after on that. So I think if we're going from a really simple top-down perspective, it's like, okay, we know we're probably adding mass or volume to the muscle. We're probably either lengthening or widening fascicles. But then when we're taking that bottoms up approach, it gets really complicated. I know a lot of people with that bottoms up, they'll kind of reduce it down to, okay, we get myogenic signal in. That includes everything like IGF-1, IL-6, and all those other growth factors. We have some kind of mTOR signal integration. Then we have muscle protein synthesis, myonuclear addition. And that sounds really nice, but when we're looking at fields like systems biology or, com or computational biology, what you realize is things that seem like they should be extremely simple are way more complex than we could even imagine. Like even one signaling pathway, when you look at a network model for it, there could literally be hundreds of cross like pollinating inputs that are going to influence it. So I think with hypertrophy, we kind of have to be comfortable knowing, hey, we understand some things that do work in practice, these applied principles. But if we're saying like, what, how does this work on a fundamental level? Like what is the source code? I think we probably understand maybe five to 10% of that at best and the rest of it, we just kind of have to be comfortable with uncertainty and saying like, hey, we understand some things, we know what this isn't, but we can't say we fundamentally understand what hypertrophy is or even how it works. Do you agree with that, Pat, the five to 10% of understanding kind of the fundamental mechanisms behind hypertrophy, does that sound right? Who knows? Right. Uh, but... <clears throat> You know, I, I, I've, you know, I've created a, 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 my own model of trying to organize training. And, uh, and basically what I've done with it is I generally throw out physiology principles, uh, exercise physiologist that throws out physiology when it comes to trying to organize training and, uh, and, and be able to program things. And, and in large part, I do that because when I think of physiology, it's, it's this evolutionary stepwise phenomenon. And evolution, I've compared previously to like the old man with the junkyard in his front yard that lives on the corner of the block. That you're like, oh man, this guy's house is a mess. His front yard is a mess. You know, he's like rebuilding, trying to make microwaves out of old toaster parts and like, you know, car engine parts. And it's it's the same thing with with evolution, where you know um, you try to trace the the history of every anatomical part on a human, and you you sort of see like where it came from and you're like, Oh, our larynx was used to be gills. And you know, the vagus nerve made sense on a fish, but now it's just this wandering uh, mess of a nerve that sort of is like, you know, innervating things in such a random order at random, but it's, it's a, uh, you know, to me, it's kind of like the redundancy in physiology is always going to make things difficult. It's like, people are like, Oh, I think I'm targeting the glycolytic system or the oxidative system. And it's like, you're not like, it's, it's too much of a, a jumbled up mess. And, and it's going to be a similar thing with hypertrophy where we'll discover like, you know, contingency plans and alternative pathways. And even the, the same pathway on a different person might operate from different signaling mechanisms or something along those lines. And, and it just becomes a, a very convoluted sort of approach. And, and you know, like I got to thinking along these lines, I was reading Jeff Hawkins book on intelligence and he, 
he was an early pioneer in trying to create devices with artificial intelligence. And he believed that the only way to be able to do that was to study the human brain since it was the smartest thing that we have available to us. And, um, and what he realized is like, if you want to build smart cars and other things like that, like a human brain is always like, you can't have a cognition moment without an emotional experience to go along with it, without a sensory experience to go along with it, without a motor experience. Like you can't think without having a muscular action somewhere in the body that corresponds to it. And it's because of the associations that are built into synaptic connections. Like you literally can't do anything without having all of the components of the brain work together to be able to create the experience. And, and I think that it's probably a similar sort of thing when it comes to all the other tissue systems where they're like these associated networks, that, that word network comes up more and more, the more that you get into any particular organ system of how it operates. And, and just sort of like, you have all the systems operating at once to some degree in a gradation format and trying to be able to pinpoint it down to like the dominance of one over another is, is oftentimes where you're left with. And it, so it, like percentage wise, who knows? Like it's a gradient type of a system and most systems are based on more of a simplistic rule. So like, <clears throat> for instance, like here's where I'm, I'm going with that as a for instance, you know, I spent a lot of time trying to go into the brain and understand uh, neural concepts related to training. And that takes you into some weird directions. But ultimately like a, a brain is a memory uh, and a triggering behavior system, you know, on a very simplistic level. And it's a more advanced version of older systems that do the same thing. And, and probably the oldest system in our bodies that do that is our, <clears throat> is our DNA. You know, our DNA is just a, a memory system that was given to you by all of your ancestors put together all the way back to your first ancestor. And you have these instinctive sort of, like even the shape of your body, is a memory that is programmed into you at the level of the DNA. And the behavior of building you out from there is, is the process of activating those memories. Uh, so it's, it's just like as time increases, we have other systems and tissue types and organs that emerge uh, along the pathway of any particular species. So I look at most tissue types as being something, everything, if, if DNA, is a memory and behavior enactment system. Every other type of tissue that comes after it is also a memory and behavior type of tissue uh, because you, evolution cannot throw out any of the previous things that it ever used. Evolution works the same way as if, if you took aviation science and it worked the same way as evolution, every new modern Boeing jet would have to be still built with the same pieces as went into the Wright brothers plane and every other plane that was built after the Wright Brothers plane, which had to include the previous pieces of the previous planes. So you can never throw anything out with evolution. You can only repackage, reshuffle, reuse. And that means to me that if I'm really getting down to the functioning of skeletal muscle, the operational systems of it, if I'm going to hypertrophy, it's a memory, it's a prediction, it's a behavior enactment system at its most fundamental level. And then all of the you know, the pathways from a physiological standpoint that we encounter, they begin to make more sense from that perspective. You know what I mean? They are there to be able to store associated networks of memories that can be, you know, combined under a patterned, pattern recognition system that can unfold and allow you to be able to demonstrate certain behaviors under conditions. So, to me, hypertrophy is just new networks and associations of pattern recognition that can be directional, you know. So that, that to me is where I get most fascinated with hypertrophy from the perspective of just comparing tissue types to each other. And from it being kind of like, I'm always looking for what's the simple rule because biology is a fractal design. It's all going to be very similar. If you can identify the first most simple model that all the other models unfold and make more sense as just being more complex variations of the simple model, but still having to kind of go by that first fractal rule and that, that, that preceded all the other ones. So, you know, it just, that's, that's kind of like, if, if really going to be like my introductory sort of like uh, 
statement about where I think it all starts from. That's, that's kind of it. Right. So what was interesting about adding that layer of um, evolution is when I think of hypertrophy, I almost think of it as an environmental adaptation. So when we're talking about hypertrophy, one of the things that always drives me crazy is like you go into the gym and you ask someone what they're training that day and they're like, oh, I'm doing a hypertrophy training session. It's like, what is a hypertrophy training session? Like, what are you possibly doing today that's going to cause your muscles to grow? Because what hypertrophy is, it's like a compounding stimulus. If we think of the environment around us, but training is also part of our environment. So when you're continually doing a certain type of training, you're also adding a degree of an environmental stimulus. So you're forcing your body into a position where the environment is such that hypertrophy will become an outcome of that. And what becomes really interesting when we're getting into these like evolutionary models is we think of the shape of our body like Pat was talking about and that how and that's encoded in our genes. But there's another force acting on our bodies that's going to dictate these shapes that it takes and all these processes that occur over long evolutionary time scales, which is also physics is acting on us. So we think of evolution and people talk about like the shapes that our bodies are taking and all these different things. And we can't explain all this perfectly with Darwinian evolutionary theories. And they use that as a critique that like, oh, evolutionary models, like they're bullshit, whatever. I live in the Southeast, so I encounter plenty of that on a normal basis. Um, but that's not a improper critique, but it also doesn't take into account, like when you see a snowflake outside, like it has perfect six fold symmetry and we're not like, oh, it was evolution playing on that snowflake. So that snowflake, a specific shape was formed, defined by the laws of physics around it. So in the same way, our body shapes are being formed by a combination of our environment, including like the biophysical reality that we're in and these evolutionary processes. So if we're looking at the body from both of those standpoints, like what are the physical constraints we're putting on it? What is the environment that it's in? then what has our body developed to do over longer time scales? That's where I think we can get into a lot of these like kind of weird and nuanced discussions of like, what is hypertrophy? How does it work? Like, what do we need to do to make this like phenotypic expression like appear and manifest into the world? So I guess in maybe in line with that to maybe go a little bit deeper, even in that environmental aspect of things before we dive into those specific how to do it questions, uh, can we explore the the additional factors beyond the, like you said, the the evolutionary one and the environment one? Talk about nutrition, talk about uh, hormonal status, sleep, all those things, and how that's going to impact our uh, our ability or not to actually put on muscle mass. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so I always think of it like, <clears throat> why would a human body want to put on muscle mass? It's it's expensive tissue. <clears throat> you have to be driving some sort of signal to the body that says that it's more important to hold on to this expensive tissue than it is to get rid of it. And from like, if, if you look at our history as an animal, uh, for the most part, like carrying around a tremendous amount of muscle might not have been the best strategy to be able to survive on this planet. Um, you know, it de I think it depends kind of on like where you lived and you know, where your ancestors lived and all that kind of stuff. But you got to appreciate like, you know, the body cares a whole hell of a lot more about surviving and making it as ec economical as possible to survive on this planet as possible, much more than like being able to grow tissue. So, you know, I think about like, we're African animals, we, we had to deal with tremendous heat loads for the majority of our time on this planet. Uh, we practiced persistence hunting with an endurance design to be able to drive that. We were really like heat dissipation machines in a lot of ways. And carrying around like an unbelievable amount of muscle tissue is probably not the best way to go about like dr dumping heat. You know, I, I know like, look, like uh, I, I'm, I can't even exist if I'm not in constant air conditioning and I can't sleep unless there's a fan blowing on me at all points in time. Like I would do very poorly trying to live out in the savanna. Now, certainly like we moved to other places as an animal and we, you know, we, we took our new terrains and like, and, and if you just look at like different populations around the world, there's clearly like certain uh, 
certain areas where humans have their ancestry traced to that have greater bone density and more muscle mass and things of that nature. And there's other areas where there's lower bone density, lower muscle mass. <clears throat> but you have to just, I, I just always think like, you know, you, you probably, like I said, it's expensive tissue. It's difficult to maintain, let alone grow at a, like once you're beyond like the most beginner levels of training, uh, you've got to be able to be, you've got to create some sort of circumstances that are such a clear and present constant signal of a need to grow that it's like, it's, it's, it's almost got to be like a, a crazy situation. Like I picture it like, why would my body grow? Well, maybe if it was like forced to do some insane job day in and day out where I have to like lift unbelievably heavy loads and it's almost like my life depends upon it, then that's enough of a signal to drive and promote constant growth of some kind. And at the same time, like I would also need to be able to provide the resources that are requisite for being able to do that. And, and I have friends that are, you know, competitive bodybuilders and, and that's what the, they're doing this for, for their, you know, that's their primary objective in the world more than anything else, you know? And, and, you know, it's like, we always have good conversations about like, you know, what really matters at the end of all of this and, and that kind of a deal. And it's like, do you just need to provide enough of a signal from a training perspective? And then it's all nutrition and recovery after that, you know, is that, is that really what it comes down to is just as long as the signal is met, now everything becomes, you know, how much, uh, how many nutrients can you get into your body and how much can you allow your body to just go into some sort of an anabolic state? And I mean, they don't know and I don't know. And I always bring up like old school animal models where it's like, hey, we're just going to tie these weights to this pigeon's wings and make it fly, you know, and the more that the pigeon flies with more more weight, the bigger the wing muscles get, or like, hey, we're just gonna cut the soleus or the gastroc off of this rat, and then the all other muscle is going to grow because it's so overloaded at this point. And I don't know if they really like made the rat like focus on rat chow and sleep during those studies. But, um, you know, I, I just think that, that it's gotta be either this, this such an overloaded mechanical signal that's driven in that's like, Hey, you, you better grow or you're going to suffer some really nasty consequences that, that will threaten your survival if you don't grow. Or it's the alternative of just like, hey, as long as some requisite signal is met, now it's entirely just based upon like, how much food can you get into your body and how much sleep can you acquire? And those are almost competing things because if you sleep too much, you don't have enough time to eat. Uh, but it, I, I do, th I think it comes down to like one of those two sorts of, of realms of thinking about it. Yeah, I mean, I'd agree with that. And the thing is, we have no way to really parse that out. So I mean, I tend to think that it is about that environmental stimulus, because yeah, why would in one thing to keep in mind as well is a hypertrophy has to make sense for us. But one of the things that I always think about is is hypertrophy just a byproduct of all the other constraints and degrees of freedom that our body has? Like our physiology is self-organized in such a way to allow us to survive and breed, and that's literally what our purpose is. So is hypertrophy just a byproduct of all those systems? Like we're just taking advantage of it, and that's what's allowing us to hypertrophy, and because of that, there's always going to be some kind of natural limit or constraint to where additional hypertrophy is no longer productive. Because if we think about like, why do muscles stop growing? There's like a lot of different reasons for that. One could be like diffusion distances of oxygen getting into the fibers. So at some point, more hypertrophy is going to be counterproductive for us. We're going to have less of an ability to reproduce, survive, and thrive by gaining more muscle mass. So I'm always thinking about in a similar way, like, well, if that's the case, then how do we need to change our environment to allow for more hypertrophy? And we know that the food, the sleep, all those things are important. If I'm training really hard and I'm not eating, I'm not sleeping, it's like, well, hypertrophy would not be the way that my body's best could cope with that environment. It would create other adaptations that are going to make me more able to survive with that chronic environmental stress that I'm in. So I think for me, I'm like, well, it's probably making the environment good enough that hypertrophy actually makes sense in that context and that that's a reasonable survival strategy for us. And then just layering on the stimulus repeatedly to make that the primary environmental stimulus that we're trying to survive and adapt to 
not making the primary environmental stimulus that we're trying to survive and adapt to is chronic stress from checking my email 40 times a day or yelling at people in traffic because that's going to be a very different adaptation than getting my biceps bigger from curling 30 sets a week. In your guys' mind, what's the kind of best case scenario if you had unlimited resources in terms of testing this and for you know, the trainer that doesn't have many extra resources but wants to track that progress for their client over time, what do you recommend? I almost recommend the same thing in both circumstances. <laughs> How strong are you getting stronger and what's your scale weight look like? You know, yeah, like strong that is well like Generally, I don't have people waste money on Dex or ultrasound, any of these things. The way that I think about it, previously we had this idea that like progressive overload is needed for hypertrophy. But you could kind of flip the causality and say, if you are progressively overloading over time, it's because your muscles have grown. So it's like, are you adding load to the bar? Or are you adding reps across sets? And is your scale weight getting higher? Potentially you could recomp. So I think using those training progressions if those are occurring over long enough time scales, like you're consi consistently progressively overloading for six months, 12 months, years, your muscles had to have grown for that to happen. Yeah, scale weight and bar weight. Fantastic. Are they, are they both going in a direction that makes sense. And then just look at your damn self in the mirror. You know what I mean? Like uh, you could do skin folds. I think skin folds are probably a pretty decent uh, marker as well. Like. Uh, just, just use whatever you want to use in terms of like consistent measurements with the same person, person measuring them. And then if you're getting straight, like, like if your barbell weight is going up, if your scale weight is staying the same then your skin folds are going down, like you can probably, it's probably better for a lot of, uh, you know, actual real deal strength athletes than, than a lot of the really fancy expensive pieces. So I, I think that that's a, a great combo is, is those three things. But the two biggest ones are scale weight and barbell weight. You guys talked about the, uh, let's say how extra muscle mass is not necessarily a good idea for us as humans to carry around all the time. Um, what's the effect of that additional muscle mass on, say, O2 delivery utilization and CO2 clearance for people that might, let's say for endurance athletes, for example, what's the cost of that? Uh, you know, if, if before I dive into that, like I always... I think about things from other animals' perspectives a lot. You know what I mean? Like I, I, I try to be less human-centric in a lot of ways. And I think about like odd things in the animal world of like, you know, deer that have huge antlers and, and other animals that just have these showcase pieces, peacocks and birds that have these additions that make it like harder for them to fly. But <clears throat> the reason that they have these these things like why would you want to be brightly colored now you stand out and like a predator can see you easily more easily or like why do you have this enormous thing hanging from your head that like makes it harder to go through life and you know um when i, I don't remember which book i i got this from but it's it's like these behavioral economics uh people that, that think along these lines and like they're like well you know what's impressive is like winning a hundred meter race Okay, but what would be more impressive would be if you could win the 100 meter race with your arm tied behind your back, because that shows how much more dominant than the other males you are that you would be going against. And, and it's a similar sort of a thing with these other animals that have these showcase pieces. And to me, uh, skeletal muscle mass when it reaches extreme levels is similar, you know, like, uh, <clears throat> from a survival standpoint, if you lived out in the wild, if you're like a huge um, competitive bodybuilder that would be able to step on stage, you're probably extremely limited in like your movement capabilities and your endurance is probably really questionable. And this is kind of getting more into your question, but it's like, it's almost like if you can survive and get through life and do all the things that other people can do, even though you're carrying around all of this sort of like ridiculous tissue, that's even more impressive. And, and who is it directed towards? Well, it's directed towards being an attractive billboard to be able to reproduce from. And, and that's like what drives the majority of, of things and for, for like the outcomes that we're looking for. And, uh, you know, I, I, I got into reading a lot of stuff on, on just kind of like evolutionary theory and, and, you know, like the things that people are least likely to take care of are the things that happen that wouldn't necessarily reduce your chances of being able to reproduce. So uh, they're, they're just, they're like mismatched conditions medically between what our ancestors would have not presented with and what we as modern people present with. Like, for instance, like flat feet didn't exist in our ancestors and 
myopia for the most part didn't exist and like myopia didn't exist because you probably would have been really at risk if you can't see very well and you didn't realize that was a bear that was like 200 yards away from you uh so you probably wouldn't reproduce you'd get wiped out but now it's like you can just wear glasses or shoes and nobody cares like you know like women aren't like oh that flat-footed fool over there like i'm definitely not going to get in a relationship with him because of those flat feet uh and but like the things that we will take care of are are the things that like are visually observable that would detract from your ability to reproduce during your reproductive years so like mismatched diseases like most of the heart diseases like people don't take care of that shit because if you're going to die from it you're going to die usually after your reproductive years uh it's it's like that's the theory for why we do a lot of the things that we do and and i i think that that still is like just such a powerful uh concept like you don't you don't the the majority of things that we do even if we don't realize it are still driven from our genes and we're so desiring to be better billboards to be able to promote our genes so that they can make it to the next level of, of time. But, uh, you know, it would have to be something like from a growing of skeletal muscle, like it would have to be something that's such a powerful attractor in a lot of ways. And it is. I mean, if we look at it, it seems to be that in our culture, like we are obsessed with human bodies. And we are obsessed with having like these ratios and presentations of morphology. And, you know, it's, it's like we, people love the freak show in a lot of ways, like, but it is still this competition of like, you know, our genes don't realize that we don't live in, you know, 20,000 years ago, uh, open, open woodland environments. So it's always this competition of like modern oddities that might enhance your reproduction chances that could lead to future alterations in our species presentation versus the old stuff that would have mattered on how well you could have survived combating with each other all the time like I'm sure that the deer with the huge antlers you know uh, eight million years ago it wasn't the same thing it takes time for these these changes to be able to demonstrate themselves in a species but we can still push these epigenetic changes particularly if a signal is strong enough and particularly if we can create like external, you know, if it, like that, you know, sort of getting into adding drugs to the equation or something that could be a super physiological stimulus. Uh, but, you know, those are, those are areas that I, I really think about strongly uh, when, I'm, when I'm trying to, to picture what would really be a cap or a driver for the presentation of one particular tissue type or organ system really making a, a demonstrable change in its morpholo morphological presentation, either during an animal's life or during the time course of a species uh, external present, like phenotype expression. And then when, you know, what you were talking about in terms of like how would a tremendous increase in, in hypertrophy affect uh, endurance and things like that? Well, I mean, if you are going to be driving only a, a tension stimulus and you're not driving like a need for somebody to, to you know, enhance their capillary density and mitochondrial density, you're gonna burn out really fast. Uh, you know, it, the number of contractions that a muscle performs is the primary driver for mitochondrial biogenesis in, in, a, in a vocal environment. And now you just have to make sure that the ratio of mitochondria to uh, you know, myofibrillar density is enough to be able to support repeat contractions. That being said, now once you've created an unbelievable amount of, of skeletal muscle, that skeletal muscle has the capacity to perform incredibly high levels of output. And with that output, now you're able to make a lot of waste products. And those waste products have to be cleared. And you kind of have like a three system method of being able to clear waste products. You can buffer it in the blood you can ex exhale it at the level of the lungs and the third one will be you can ultimately excrete it at the kidneys but it's it's oftentimes that the the rate limiter in an exercise situation is the ability to exhale it at the lungs and if you haven't developed the fitness of the exhalation muscles to a high enough degree it's hard to actually blow off enough of that co2 to be able to maintain and repeat a lot of activity
because it's you just if you're gonna have a bigger engine you need a bigger exhaust pipe um ultimate or or it's just gonna overheat burn out and, and have too much gunk and, and gumming of the parts right so one i like that you had mentioned the expiratory component because one of the things that i see is everyone's talking about inspiratory muscle training seems to be that most people think that's the only source of diaphragm fatigue that your inspiratory muscles fatigue and one of the things that i do see when we put a lot of athletes through testing is that it is actually their expiratory muscles that are the issue they're not able to clear co2 quick enough so if i'm thinking about that um kind of balance between gaining as much muscle mass as possible and how that impacts energetics the things that i'm generally thinking of are one the person who gains a lot of muscle mass they're going to be able to create more tension in the muscle and your ability to get blood from the heart into the working muscle is going to be um, dictated by the relationship between your cardiac output and local muscle tension such that the more tension you could create in the muscle the more um, the lower the percentage of your max voluntary contraction that you'll either get a venous occlusion reaction or an arterial occlusion reaction so what you generally see is those athletes that get a lot of hypertrophy and they could create a shit ton of tension in the muscle they're generally not spending hours a week doing low intensity aerobic work or trying to improve their cardiac output so you often see that these guys are creating venous occlusion on the muscle with as low as 20% of their one rep max. They're often cutting off blood flow to the artery at like 60, 65% of their one rep max, which is pretty damn low. And some endurance athletes, you see that at like 90% of the one rep max. So with those athletes, if they're restricting blood flow to the muscle, if you're getting venous occlusion, A, you're restricting the amount of blood that could get into the muscle, but you're not getting waste products out of the muscle, which Pat had already mentioned. You're also not getting O2 into the muscle. And if we're kind of breaking down that um, like dichotomy between like resistance training and energy system work or conditioning, kind of the same thing. It's all just the language of tension and energetics of the muscle. So the more hypertrophy you're getting, the less you're able to get O2 into the muscle, the less you're able to get waste products out. Generally, you won't be able to clear CO2 quick enough because you're probably not getting a lot of respiratory system development. So I think you're basically making a functional system of a human who's really good at desaturating the muscle and creating peripheral muscle fatigue. But if you're trying to think of the functional system of someone who's really good at surviving out in the world, like someone who could go survive in the wilderness, um, it's probably not that person. So I think the limit of hypertrophy that we would have seen in like a classic evolutionary scenario is gonna be so different than what you could see now because like, me and Pat had to go into the wilderness for three weeks. Like, unless you're going to eat me, you're probably going to die sooner than me because you need more food. Um, you're probably not going to be able to climb up a tree to get away from a bear as easily. I've never seen you climb, but I'm assuming gravity's going to pull down on you a little bit more. But if we're in modern day environments right now, we're both sitting in air conditioning rooms, like these environmental pressures aren't acting on you. So the way that I think about it is like, what are all the negatives that come with hypertrophy? And those aren't that relevant right now, but it sounds like um, with that question, it's like, well, how does hypertrophy impact performance in sport? Because at some point, if we're competing in an energetic sport, whether that's CrossFit or MMA or wrestling, I'm just thinking of like the things that I've competed in just because I have personal experience. There's going to be some point where more muscle mass is actually going to make you worse at your sport. So you kind of create this like more nuanced situation with like, what does hypertrophy do? What are all the side effects of that? And how do you balance that between like getting O2 into the muscle? Have you found any relationship between those blood trend, uh, occlusion trends and uh, how people present? Like, uh, is it the morphotype that the kind of shape of the body that, that people present? Uh, have you seen that in, in, in the work that you've done? Kind of, you can tell by the way somebody's built, kind of how it functions under the hood. So one of the things you have to keep in mind, yes, but it's also the way that someone's body presents is going to be a combination of their physiology and then the type of training that they're subjected to. So that's like that environmental component. So if we had someone who's delivery limited and they're a 5K runner, they're going to look like every other 5K runner. They're not going to be carrying a lot of muscle mass because even though theoretically they would occlude at lower percentages, they're not doing anything that's going to create a lot of local muscle desaturation and tension. So they're not going to grow. But when we have those athletes who present with that delivery deficiency and they're doing a sport like CrossFit, like to them, CrossFit is just BFR work or hypertrophy work because they're 
like you see a lot of those guys there cutting off blood flow to, or they're cutting off venous outflow or arterial inflow all the time when they're doing Metcons, they're completely desaturating muscles during Metcons. So for these guys, it's like, well, CrossFit and hypertrophy work are basically the same thing. So I think there is some relationship in that way. And one of the other things that we see is these athletes that are very skewed, like a lot of times working with CrossFit athletes, I'll get these dudes that come from field sport backgrounds, typically um, like a soccer lacrosse player who spent like 15 years running up and down a field. And when they start doing CrossFit, you'll see that their upper body gets jacked and they gain a lot of strength in their upper body, but their lower body doesn't gain strength or muscle mass as quickly. And if you do some zoning in their upper and lower body, you might see that they cut off um, venous outflow at like 25% in their upper body. They cut off arterial inflow at like 65%, but then you look at their lower body and you're like, they don't get venous occlusion until like 40% of their one rep max. They might not get arterial occlusion until maybe 85%. So you see this weird distribution. And for those athletes, if you want to make it easier to put muscle mass on their lower body, you want to A, potentially make delivery worse, but also train to speed up their rate of oxygen utilization in the muscles, so then you could shift that balance and you make it that their cardiac output is insufficient to push through the amount of tension they're making in that muscle, and you're going to make them more prone to hypertrophy. In. It's just fascinating. You know, I don't, I don't directly measure those things in people, but it's, it's always interesting. Like, you know, I, I, I work with Ethan Grossman and he's a competitive bodybuilder and, um, you know, we, we bought our, we bought a Moxie a few years ago and, and, uh, he was coached by Aaron Davis and, uh, he worked with Ben quite a bit and, you know, it was always interesting trying to look at him and, and measure everything and see like, you know, where does he start to cut off in terms of, of going into a total desaturation? Like what percent of his one rep max does that occur? And, and how much does this relate to actually like whether or not he's going to grow or not? Um, and, and it, you know, it, it, was, it was a lot of work to try to see all of that information. And, and ultimately, you know, it's, it's like it, at a certain point, and he's unbelievably diligent and meticulous with his record keeping and that, and that kind of stuff. And uh, it's, it's impressive when someone's actually that compliant and, and applies it to, this, to that degree. And there's just like an upper limit on how far anything can seem to go. And then it just like this, it just – you know, no matter how much you try to rig it or, or game it or something like that, it's just like, man, this thing won't budge at a certain point um, uh, uh, beyond that. But, um, you know, the, I, just, I just always find the theories to be so compelling and interesting in terms of like, you know, is it that we have to make these tissues work in a hypoxic environment? Like, is that the key? You know, is that the, the big signal that really is going to drive this? And, and where we started this thing was kind of like, well, we don't really know. We know that there's like, all these potential signals, like, is it hypoxia? Is it some sort of like a, a, a local, uh, you know, hormonal stimulus from things like a mechanical growth factor? Is it some sort of epigenetic memory in there that, that drives it? Is it, you know, these hormones traveling from a great distance away? Is it purely mechanical tension? Is it, and it's like, ah, God, like nobody, nobody can really like pinpoint a keystone variable Maybe it's tension, maybe it's some certain, but I think that ultimately it's just like a, probably like a, a, a sufficient intensity of load that is in a progressive overloaded manner of being distributed to the organism that consistently leads to growth with a hypercaloric background of, of nutrition. And, and like, that's, that's probably like where I'm like at in terms of like things that I'm super comfortable with in terms of almost certainty of you're going to grow is that's basically it. Um, if, if you have those factors sitting there, but at the same time, and so it's just, it's, and it's always just like um, some degree of novelty, I think is also from time to time seems to be enough to be able to promote some sort of a, I don't know, the right stimulus of some kind to be able to, to get an organism going again. Uh, who knows? Maybe it's, it's pathway fatigue. Maybe it's, it's something else. Like <clears throat> I heard, I heard Mike Isertel, um do a, a very interesting talk in regards to pathway fatigue and just talking about like the mTOR pathway and like, 
you know, using training stimulus to try to, that, that more directly targets that, like your classical kinds of like, you know, eight to 15 rep bodybuilding style training with, with lots of sets and, 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 um, and things like that. And like, how long can you run with that as your primary training method before like that, that pathway becomes fatigued and like what might be indicators that that pathway is becoming fatigued. Like generally speaking, muscle tissues themselves go through a, um, a fiber type transformation where they're becoming increasingly more fatigue resistant and presenting with more and more of a type one fiber presentation. Uh, and, and let's say that we've like actually fatigued this pathway and the fiber types have, have reverted to a slow twitch presentation that quite honestly, I don't know if that's worse for growth or not, uh, based upon, you know, newer information, but we used to think that type two fibers had a greater potential for growth. But, uh, if I have fatigued this pathway and if these fibers are now no more resistant to growth, what could I do to be able to allow the pathway to, to recover essentially? while not losing anything. And it was like, well, you know, during those particular times, like lower volume, higher intensity, more classic kind of powerlifting or strength style training might be a great way to be able to drop volume, which would, you know, cause the fibers to shift back towards being more type two expressive since they don't need to be as fatigue resistant. And a very high level of tension should be enough to be able to maintain the hypertrophy until the, the pathway and the fibers have recovered enough to be able to try to drive that pathway and fiber type, you know, uh, capacity to grow uh, once more. But whether or not that's actually true is, is, is impossible to say. So it's, it's like, you know, I, I do love all of the different approaches, you know, whether it be just logic that you work your way through, uh, whether it be actually using technology to try to demonstrate when the tissue is actually going into a state change in terms of what it's relying upon. Um, but ultimately at the end of it, it's just kind of like, uh, man, I don't know, keep working hard and eat more food. <laughs> um, and, and that's a boring answer because, and I hate the answer quite honestly, because I love, I love hearing thoughts and I love thinking about, you know, what's actually happening under the hood, but it's a, uh, it's a crazy world under the hood that we don't really, really fully understand how it all plays together. Evan, uh, I heard you talk about an interesting, I guess, idea or model that talked about load um, O2 levels and motor unit recruitment and how maybe essentially all roads lead to mechanical tension, some through direct loading, some through lack of O2, which means metabolic stress, which means motor unit recruitment. Can you talk about this idea a little bit? Yeah. So, um, what I was talking about in that specific case was the oxygen conforming response that we um, see in the muscle, which the oxygen conforming response that the simplest definition would be if force output is maintained then as blood flow is restricted and oxygen levels decrease in that muscle, we'll see ever increasing levels of motor unit recruitment as we approach a low oxygen environment. So basically what this takes us to is like, well, we know on a population level average, we're taking a set at like 30% of one rep max or set at like 90% of one rep max to true failure on a set for set basis. Those will probably be, a beat, be about equal in terms of hypertrophy the actual percentages are going to be a little bit different person to person, day to day. Let's just pretend those are like stone pillars for the sake of the example. So if we think about, and this is where like getting into mechanisms, like who the fuck knows if this is accurate. Um, so theoretically we might say, okay, you're training very heavy on the high end of that range. Well, once you start repping out that load, you're going to quickly either restrict venous outflow or arterial inflow. So within a few reps, maybe five reps, you'll completely desaturate that muscle and you'll get maximum motor unit recruitment. And we see in a lot of those studies is when someone does a set at like 75, 80% of their one rep max, they get max motor unit recruitment off the bat. Where if you're using a load at maybe 40% of your one rep max and repping it out to failure, like if I use a 40% one RM, I could probably do 50 or 60 reps with it. So it's really not going to be that challenging for probably the first 35 reps. 
So what we see is I'll be progressively desaturating that muscle as I'm doing more and more volume, and that's going to drive peripheral mus muscle fatigue eventually, assuming my like cardiorespiratory system isn't the limiting factor. Like if it is, then it's probably not going to lead to hypertrophy. But assuming it is that limiting factor, that peripheral muscle fatigue will in will lead to increased motor unit recruitment, which will eventually lead to mechanical tension. So we could get into like all these micro details, but on, on a surface level, what this really comes down to is as long as you're training heavy enough and you're actually working really hard on every work set, it's gonna lead to hypertrophy. So it just becomes a lot more practical and that like, yeah, I don't care if you're using 35.7% of your one rep max or like 98.25% of your one rep max if your goal is hypertrophy and not necessarily absolute strength. It's like you just need to be training heavy enough and you actually need to be working really hard so you're completely desaturating that muscle. And then we know that you're going to be doing effective volume. So I think that's where we could kind of take this like underlying theory or getting into like the bottoms up mechanisms. And then, um, like meet it with like applied practice like what actually works in the real world we know doing more volume up to a point works in the real world we know progressively overloading works in the real world we know eating works more in the real world as long as we're actually doing things in practice that we know work then we could theorize about these mechanisms and maybe a better understanding on that level lets us tweak our approaches a little bit better like if i understand why that 30 to 90 percent cutoff range exists in the real world maybe if it is due to like the relationship between cardiac output and muscle tension well then it just gives us more options like if pat's someone who includes at 20 percent of his one rep max now great he could train between 20 and 90 percent of his one rep max in hypertrophy for me i might find it's between 40 and 95 percent of my one rep max so it gives us the ability to individualize training a little bit more in terms of volumes and loads but fundamentally, we're both going to have to do the same thing, which is just push our sets really close to failure, do more sets in a week. And I think the best like bodybuilders, they figure this stuff out. Like one of the things that was always super frustrating to me, um, my dad is, he's been a bodybuilder for like 40 years now, and he's also a computer scientist. So he's like pretty analytical. And every time I would like find new studies or I would do this like kind of research on site and I would tell him about it. He just see it and like, oh, I figured that out 25 years ago. And or he'd say, like, okay, how does this change my training? And he'd tell me what he's doing. And I'm like, oh, well, it doesn't change your training. Like you've been training so long that you figured out what works for you. And it's the same things that we figure out when we look at these underlying mechanisms. So in my mind, like using this tech, using this science. All that it really does is it just cuts down the amount of time that it takes to figure out what works for someone. But inevitably, if you're actually analyzing your training and you're taking like a pretty logical and methodical approach to it, you're going to figure these things out anyway. Pat? I mean, it's just very well stated. Um, you know, I, I think that from the perspective of what are some other, like another application piece, uh, I think that, that the more that we're in, rep ranges that seem to be classically associated with hypertrophy training. I mean, so like not one rep max training, you know, but if we're, if we're somewhere, you know, six as, as the lower end, uh, the more that you're close to six, probably the farther away from failure, you can kind of be set to set to set to set to set and be receiving some sort of stimulus that would promote hypertrophy. Whereas if you're on the other end of the bumpers, out near 30 reps or something like that, you're going to have to basically be right there. You're going to have to go like to failure, you know? So the, the more that your hypertrophy promoting sets are higher in rep number, the closer to absolute failure you're going to have to go to be able to provide the right stimulus and the, the closer that you're to the lower end. And, and like you said, Evan, that really does present with other logistical problems namely like the more that you're out near the high rep end, the more that you're probably going to be driving peripheral or i'm sorry like system fatigue and just like you know your your respiratory system is working maximally your cardiac system is working maximally your met you know your buffering systems are working maximally like your whole body is trying to deal with this threat that you've imposed upon yourself and the limiter in terms of the training session might not be the volume that the muscle is capable of promoting that would drive hypertrophy. On the flip side, on the other end, it might be that it's just like, you know, it's so heavy that it's 
It's like connective tissues and the skeleton is just getting abused through that kind of training. Um, and so you need to kind of like, for the most part, the majority of your training is going to be somewhere in between those things in this sort of classical eight to 15 range. But the weaker that you are, probably the more that you can train with, you know, somewhere around six reps and the stronger that you are, probably the more that you need to push it away from that, particularly as you age, because it's just like, you know, you just, do you learn these things over time? Because what you're talking about, like from an individual perspective of like, find out what works for you. It's a moving target as well in terms of like, where are you from a chronological perspective in your career? Uh, where are you in terms of like the actual cycle of training that you're in right now? Have you like, are you at week one where you feel fresh or are you at week nine of your block where you're like, feel like you've gotten hit by a truck? Um, so being able to try to find those out from like a very small time scale standpoint, as well as like your life scale standpoint, I think are, are really critical pieces. It's just that there's, it's such a moving target that it's, it's sometimes hard to, hard to find that out. And then you're factoring in all of these like subjective appraisal pieces as well, which are like, you know, sometimes I'm like subjective information is the best. And other times I'm like subjective information doesn't fucking matter. Just stick to the goddamn numbers. Um, so it's, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's a, it's an interesting, uh, process of, of like, you know, sort of seeing why the historical methods that have survived the vetting process of time made it and like then kind of confirming these, these approaches and seeing why a lot of things have sort of been like left behind as well. Um, but again, like I, I love, I love the discovery process. I love discovery. I love seeing why the story worked and just purely because it's enjoyable. Yeah. And I mean, that's where I'm at as well. Like all these things are interesting, but ultimately it doesn't necessarily change how I do things that much. A lot of times I find when athletes come and they want to work with me or consult with me, like they probably think they're going to be doing some kind of like ridiculous fancy protocol. And when you inevitably give them like what makes the most sense to give them, people are almost like upset by it. They're like, I thought I was going to be doing like this and that and like all these different things like I thought I was going to be like auto-regulating my set volume with like Nears dad and all this and I'm like well you back squat 225 pounds like you don't need to do that like just go work hard and it will take care of itself and eventually we could get into that information but right now like you're kind of just wasting the time that it takes to put that device on your muscle isn't worth the time investment because you haven't like you haven't earned that yet so I think from the discovery standpoint, it's like ultimately anything we do needs to work and per the figuring out why things work is personally interesting to me, which is why I spend so much time on it. And I do think it becomes more useful when we're dealing with like edge cases, like the people that you're like, why can't this person fucking grow their biceps? Like what is going on? And then you could use like technology, like you could use infrared thermography and you do like a heat map of the muscle and you're like, oh, there's like a hypothermic region in their bicep, which means there's like poor metabolic activity. Maybe they have like a neuropathy or something and that's why they can't hypertrophy their left bicep. And these kinds of things are interesting, but on a population level, like it's not that important. On the individual level, it could allow us to figure a lot of these things out. It could speed up the training process. But we're on at these days, so I'm like, I think everyone has a natural limit and utilizing a lot of these technologies and a lot of these methods just makes you hit your natural limit in a shorter period of time, but it might not actually raise your ceiling. So maybe instead of taking 11 years to reach your natural muscular potential, maybe you take six years. Like, that's great. It's good to get there quicker, but ultimately, like, what are you going to do in those other five years? Like, if you really like training, what now you just don't make progress for another five years so it's like a weird thing where it's like okay I get it from a sport performance perspective because we do have a time cap like you have someone they don't want to compete for another 15 years they want to maximize a specific time scale but for hypertrophy we're talking about the amount of muscle you could gain over an entire training career and you love lifting weights like it probably doesn't matter if you gain your natural muscular potential in five years, 10 years, 15 years, if you're going to get there anyway.
So the, the nearest technology and, and I guess <clears throat> other man monitoring technologies that would allow you to somewhat maybe uh, zero in or speed up almost the process. Um, it's almost like going too specific too soon or too advanced too soon in training methods that you use with athletes where Kiowen and Flat says you rob them twice. You rob them of the linear progress they could be doing at the beginning and then you rob them of the extra gains that they would get from those advanced methods like triphasic or any other thing that a beginning beginner wouldn't be using. So don't introduce them too early so that they can have the kind of longest progress until they hit that wall and then you start using those things. Yeah, where I think those technologies, like the way that I use them, it's a few different ways that like they kind of come into my practice. Like one, we can add a layer of individualization to someone's training. I call that just like, let's not waste as much time. So if like a new client comes to me, we could run them through a few assessments on site. And that just saves me the like three months that it takes to learn something about your athlete. Like when you start working with someone, I'm always extremely skeptical of a coach that could like, I'll run you through a few tests remotely and I know everything that you need to get better. Like it's kind of bullshit, but if they come in, we could run some physiological testing. We could kind of drop a pin in the math and it will be a more accurate pin than I could do if we put them through some kind of remote testing. So it's like, maybe it saves me two or three months of trying to figure things out that I would have been able to figure out eventually anyway, but we could just get someone progressing earlier and that just gets you buying with the client. If you could kind of figure out some things that work for them in two weeks versus three months, that's always going to work well from a business standpoint. The technology also feeds into like creating protocols and methods that we use with a lot of athletes, whether or not we're using near. So particularly with concurrent training athletes, that's where I think it's most useful understanding that balance between muscle tension cardiac output, the respiratory system, and figuring out how to make athletes better. But a lot of the work with the technology, it's also just working with like professional sport teams, military organizations, people that have a vested interest in getting people better as quickly as possible because there's a lot of money on the line. Like most athletes that use the Moxie, they'll use it inconsistently for maybe a few months and they stop using it because it's a lot of work. Like Moxie isn't surgical enough that you could just pop it on and say this is what it means it's like okay you pop it on you send me a csv file i'll sit here for a half hour breaking down a file looking at all these trends then i'll know what it means and for the military for pro sport teams like they could afford to pay a lot of money to have someone analyze their data they could afford to spend upwards of 20 30 grand on monitors for an entire team or an entire squad like it's useful in those scenarios but if someone's a beginner athlete or if they're an early stage intermediate athlete, whenever those types of people ask me if they should buy these technologies, like I'll just flat out say like, no, do not buy a Moxie. Do not buy like a thermal camera. Like don't even spend a hundred bucks on something that measures your HRV and DC potential because it's just not for you yet. Until you're an advanced athlete, these technologies really don't change anything that I do on a coaching level. Like I could get the same information just by looking at their training log and their progression trends and they'll save themselves a lot of money and time. Yeah. It's funny. Like a lot of this reminds me of a, uh, of a conversation I've had with, uh, with uh, Marcos Rodriguez and, and Ethan Grossman, because those are, those are two guys that, that I work with. You know, I do a podcast with Marcos. Uh, I spend all, most of my days in normal, normal time with those guys. And, um, and, and they're very thoughtful. They're both competitive bodybuilders. They're both monstrous dudes. You know what I mean? And, um, and they're, they're educated. You know, they talk to really smart coaches. They stay updated on, on great information. And, and the conversation that we come back to a lot of the times is like, it's almost like there's, there's two camps of people that you encounter for the most part within this performance world or hypertrophy world. There's like the people that are brain people and people that are heart people is, is kind of the, the, the two groups. Like, and, and the brain people, it's like they're just trying to like logically measure, measurement-wise work their way through this and like have the most precise, perfect training program imaginable. And then there's the heart people, and they're just like, you know, the dumb guys that just work really hard. And it's like if you were to compare the two major camps against each other, which group usually comes out and as a group, is bigger and more hypertrophy and it's like probably the heart group you know what i mean because these are just the guys that go in there and they're just savages and they're trying to kill themselves and it's like the dumbest training program you could ever imagine but what they're doing 
they're all in on. And versus the other guys, they're like maybe too conservative, maybe too, uh, you know, you know, it's not perfect. So it's not, we're not going to do it. And, and I just find that to always be, be kind of interesting um, to think about. And, and I experienced that in competing in strongman too, because like, you know, I was coming in it as someone with a PhD and really organizing my training from, you know, trying to analyze advanced periodization models and apply them to a sport and, and manage everything very successfully. And, and I was losing the guys that were like coal miners from Kentucky. And it's like, you know, like, how could this possibly be the case? Like, you know, this guy, I literally saw him drinking whiskey last night and, uh, and he still smells of booze, but he just won the national championship. Like, yeah. you know, like how, how could this possibly be, be the, the reality of what we're, we're dealing with in front of us? Um, but I love the thought of just getting to your ceiling faster. You know, that's, that's um, like every now and then I'm just presented with like kind of a novel thought that I have not heard before. And it's like, what's, is there an advantage to that? And, and to me, it's like what you brought up in terms of like working with large groups or a lot of money on the line. That's when it becomes increasingly important to do things like measure and track. And it's because like a lot of these guys, number one, they don't really want to maximize their physiology on these things. So you have to have numerical pieces that are going to hold them accountable. So that if you're a basketball GM, you can look at a spreadsheet in front of you and you can see like, Hey, all of my guys actually, you know, they measured these things like this guy's HRV is a so is a indicative that he's probably not staying out until, you know, four in the morning and, you know, hasn't been popping bottles all night. He's probably going to perform slightly better or might be a better long-term investment um, as a result of actually going to bed on time and having some lifestyle factors in place that are, are, you know, from a health perspective, more conducive to supporting uh, someone from a performance standpoint. But um, so essentially the bigger the number of humans that you have to manage, probably the more important it is to have objective measurements that actually guide you as to whether or not, like how ready they are to perform, what are their lifestyle supporting factors, are they actually putting in the amount of work that's important to be able to uh, drive the necessary adaptations that we're looking to accomplish. It's purely accountability and management from that standpoint. Whereas the more that you're a one person, you know, thing, you can be much more subjective and it can be more based on conversations and seeing how people are doing. And, and if you are going to go that measurement route with people that are just like having oddities of like lack of success, even though they're doing everything, I think that's critical. The only other thing I kind of want to get into here is just sort of like what, what I've been trying to do in terms of, of uh, you know, using equipment and having the equipment be trackable. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I've set up technology to go with Kaiser equipment that is capable of, of measuring the work per rep, per set, per workout, so that you can actually see like, well, how much actual mechanical work did this human being just do in front of me? because that should be the driver of adaptation, like more work, more adaptation, you know, specific work of, you know, specific loading and velocity and duration types should lead to more prob a higher probability of getting a certain kind of adaptation. But, you know, it's, it, it will ultimately come down to volume. And what I find fascinating is that from the perspective of, of hypertrophy oriented people trying to be very, very specific and, and accountable from a tracking standpoint, we, we have not been good at, at, there's only really two variables to look at in terms of tracking resistance training and it's load and the distance that the load moves through space, you know, and, and basically we have not been good at measuring the distance that the load moves through space. We've really just been looking at the load itself. And I think that what I'm seeing anyways with using this equipment is when you actually look at work, the distance that it moves through space is so unbelievably important in terms of changing the, the, the number that you get that it's, it's shocking. It just jumps out at you so powerfully. And the way that people have little micro differences in how far they move load in a set and uh, when the weight increases is, is pretty dramatic where you can see it like, Hey, this person increased the weight on this exercise by 10 pounds from last week to this week, but their work score is lower 
And it didn't look like they were cheating any of their reps, but they must have been because that thing just told me that they were. And as a result of that, like, were you actually progressively overloading? And maybe you weren't, you know what I mean? So, so I do think that that accountability part is huge. And from the standpoint of like, what I think is probably the most important metric, it is work uh, from a hypertrophy standpoint. And whether or not we're actually measuring that work accurately, I'm now questioning based upon actually now measuring it and seeing it displayed. And, and I'll tell you, like, once you see that score being reflected back down on you after every set, after every training session, and you see like, oh, when I go from, you know, having produced 85,000 joules in the last training session to this time producing 88,000 joules, there's an enormous difference in the way that that felt, uh, both from like a systemic standpoint, as well as like a local muscular standpoint. And, um, and it's almost like it forces you to acquire the range of motion because you're always looking to make that score go up. It drives you kind of crazy if it doesn't go up or if it stays the same or it goes down. And it's like you start hunting for range of motion that maybe you wouldn't have before. And when you feel the impact and difference of what that little difference in range of motion per rep provides, it's, it's remarkable to me. Uh, and it's, it is, it's fairly simple. And I'm hoping that as uh, we develop this technology out more and like, you know, build it out beyond Kaiser to barbells and dumbbells and, and other things that, that it'll allow a higher probability of people being able to make consistent long-term uh, progress. And, and I am suspicious that, that people are actually thinking that they're progressively overloading when in fact they might not be based upon that distance part of the equation. One of the things that you were saying with, um, like, as you were talking, I was like, okay, A, that design sounds awesome because one, with actually progressively overloading, like, I'm sure you felt the temptation to you're doing like a preacher curl and you go like all the way down one week and then the next week you bump the load and you're like, well, I want to beat my reps. Like, I'll stop like right there and then I'll go on the next rep. You're like stopping and you could kind of trick yourself into believing that you're actually doing more work where it's like you're probably not, but it feels good to get better performance. You're adding more objectivity and that raises a really interesting standpoint where it's like this technology, if you guys develop that out and make it really practical for different pieces of equipment, it's like you're not doing anything that enhances someone's physiology. You're just making sure that people don't cheat themselves out of actually progressively overloading. And that's one of the things one of the ways that I think about sports science as well, I think when people are like, oh, sports science, it's for performance enhancement. They think of like Ivan Drago hooked up to like all these machines. And it's like in reality, when we're dealing with like pro sport teams or we're dealing with military organizations, the utility of sports science primarily is not to make people's performance better. It's just to stop people from wrecking themselves. Because ultimately, if you take the best athletes, like the freakiest athletes are going to be freaks no matter what. Like you take um, like the best NFL player, he's going to be like the biggest, strongest, fastest version of himself. No matter if you're like figuring out the percentages that he gets occlusion or you're maximizing all these different qualities, but what's going to perform, stop that dude from performing for years is just that he's going to do something stupid and injure himself. And you have to think from the perspective of a professional sports team or a military organization they need a return on investment and that return on investment is finances. Getting someone's back squat slightly better, improving some of these qualities in their prior sports science doesn't necessarily make a professional sport team better. And if it doesn't make the team better, they're not making any more money by you enhancing their players' performance and these like true measurable physiological qualities. But if you could stop people from getting injured, now you're saving teams a lot of money. If they acquire a new player for $10 million, and he blows out his shoulder three weeks into a season, now they're out $10 million. So they're willing to spend a few thousand on the front end to use sports science to prevent things like that from happening. So I think what a lot of these technologies are doing, like sports science does improve someone's ability to hypertrophy long-term, right, with that doing it faster, but also in that like one of the things that's going to stop all of us from progressing in our training over the decades long time period is just that all of us are going to get some kind of soft tinger, tissue or joint injury eventually. I'm sure it's happened to both you guys already at some point. I'm sure you have some kind of muscle that you deal with frequent aches and pains. 
if you could prevent that from happening, you're going to make more training progress. So it's like if we take this more multifaceted view, like, okay, maybe we could individualize training a little bit better to make things happen quicker. Maybe we could stop you from getting injured and regressing or progressing more consistently. And maybe we could make things more objective, like with what Pat's saying, like measure the work in an accurate way that actually makes sure we're doing what we think we're doing. I think between those three factors, like I don't know what else we're really going to do to make people perform better, hypertrophy more over like the year long time period. Like after that, what stones are you going to unturn at that point? What's interesting, you're talking about that, that preacher curl example and like, um, you know, people get positively rewarded for having completed the task. And oftentimes, if I make you actually stick to very strict guidelines for how you go about completing the task, well, now you don't complete the task according to your own belief systems. And now you feel very disappointed. And in many ways, it's like I, I didn't reward you, I punished you. And, and people don't respond well to punishment. Even the people that think they respond well to punishment don't. It's like the only thing we actually respond well to is positive reinforcement, you know? And generally speaking, the more that you actually do things properly from a weight room standpoint, the less positive reinforcement you receive from an accomplishing the task standpoint. And, you know, it doesn't like, unless you are someone that actually like, there's very few people that are, acknowledge like it's like to me to a lot of other people that are that have been training forever that are obsessed with this that where it is your life you have gotten to this point where you're like i you know i'm only going to compare apples to apples if it wasn't perfect i know it doesn't count but the vast majority of people do not fit into that boat like they're just like i, I mean i work with regular people general population clients and no matter how many times you tell them like if you don't go through the full range of motion. If you don't do this properly, it doesn't count. But they get tired, they just wanna get the task done, and they start quickly cheating the reps, and it's outside the confines of the way that they're supposed to do it, and they complete the task, and they feel a sense of accomplishment, they feel a positive reinforcement, they get this little dopamine hit, and that builds, a, uh, it builds future behaviors, you know what I mean? And, and now, if you actually remove, like if now the scoreboard is the thing it's the standard and you see that the number is lower due to the the kind of cheating approach that you used you don't get the positive reinforcement for just having done the reps you get punished for having done poor reps if you actually do the reps to the best case scenario that you can now for the first time you're going to get a positive reinforcement for actually having done something properly and when like I'll tell you because I've had clients that for years and you try to tell them the same damn thing over and over again and then it literally takes two sets and they see a score and they immediately change their behavior and then they hold on to this new behavior because you know like my opinion like oh that was a good set like it doesn't hold up to the power of a visual objective number that stares back at you and says, this was your set. And either this number is higher or lower than the other one. And, but people learn very quickly. It's, it's an amazing driver of that. And I will say, even for me, like as much as I think that I am actually sticking to, st like I know that like, hey, I wanna get this set done so badly I want to be showing myself that I'm making progress. I want my own training program to get positive reinforcement. Like I think I'm so smart and so great at putting together training programs that if my training program is really this good, I should get this next rep. And maybe I cheat the range of motion. Maybe I cheat the standard and the protocol for how I execute the movement. There's so many pieces of bias in every single person's brain. And even if you think it's not there, it's, it's like you need – checks and balances, you know, you need to have some external standard judging to be able to really keep you honest. And, and like you said, it is, it is to protect you from yourself in, in most circumstances. Um, you know, like 
I, I just think like, I really do love Tim Gabbett's information in terms of like load management information and, and trying to increase the probability that you're not going to put somebody into a jeopardized position physiologically uh, for them to be able to number one, perform, and number two, probably suffer less uh, preventable deleterious consequences. And, and the more that we have accurate, useful information to be able to guide that, the better. And, you know, I think with Gabbit stuff, a lot of times it's soccer clubs or something like that, and they've got their GPS information. But if, if we have a weight room metric, that's kind of like your weight room pitch count, now we can start to make this determination, like for this individual, A, like their, the amount of increased work that they should do from this week to next week should be this many joules, okay? However it is that we get there, and if we see it during their training session right there, it's like, okay, you're done. Like you're not doing another set. You're not doing another exercise. You've hit the actual numerical increase in output that is within the confines of what we as an organization find acceptable from a promotion of fitness, but a prevention of putting you into a red flag situation in terms of output. And if we have that number to be able to compare against GPS numbers, and we have those numbers to be able to compare against sleep numbers, it's just giving a, a higher probability of being able to not, to prevent people from, from their own good ideas ruining them. Because it's like people feel good and then they try to do too much, too soon, too fast. And it's like, just please stop. <laughs> like, please stop. Uh, you don't need to do more. It's a bad idea. Uh, and, and having that as, because it takes it away from it being the, the onus on you too. Like now I'm the bad guy if I tell you, I personally think you should stop versus, hey, the numbers say that you're done. The numbers say you need to do a little bit more. Yeah, and you could do something similar with mirrors. Like if you're doing, just to pick some random fucking example, if you're doing like lying leg curls for your hamstrings and you're watching your SMO2 trend going down and you're like, God damn, like I need to push this set to failure. And you're like, okay, I'm going to kind of like cheat the reps and kind of use some different muscles to get the load up. And then what you end up seeing is you're like, oh, you're shifting the recruitment pattern. So you're just not going to desaturate your hamstrings anymore. So you're like, oh, I eat three extra reps out. And you watch SMO2 going down and it's like 16%. You do three more reps and it just stays there pinned. And you're like, oh, you messed it up. Like you wanted to continue doing more work, but by virtue of doing that, now you're not doing what we were trying to do for the training standpoint. Like if your goal is to hypertrophy the hamstrings, it was actually better not to do those three extra reps. So I think you could get into this concept of like taking an internal measurement to do that or taking an external measurement to do that. And it's kind of doing the same thing. And maybe combining those gives you even more validity, like in terms of total volume that you do within a session now. It's like, okay, maybe we figure out how to make it so you're actually truly targeting that muscle as effectively as possible. Like you're not compensating, you're not cheating reps and cutting range of motion. Because I think the range of motion is one thing, but then you also have to get into like not changing your recruitment pattern too. So you could kind of tack tackle it from both sides. And if you're using mirrors too, like you'll see when a muscle can't do more volume in a session because that muscle is going to stop utilizing O2. So it's like you could make sure the sets are actually effective. You could take subjective, like maybe I'm supposed to do set 10 sets of chest today. You know, after seven, it really sucks. And it's easy to convince yourself that the extra volume is not productive when it really is just because you don't want to do it. And no one's completely above that. Like even if you've been training for years um, and on the opposite side, it's really easy for me to convince myself that doing more volumes better. Like I come from a track and field background, like, if I've learned one thing through my entire training career it's that I always do too much and just like, that's my stupidity is that I'm going to do too much and get burnt out or injured. So I could look at objective data and if I'm doing hypertrophy work, I'm like, okay, I'm literally not desaturating oxygen in this muscle anymore. So anything that I do is truly not productive. So it's just figuring out all of these unfortunate, like, expensive and kind of complicated ways to just like take our ability to screw things up out of the equation. Like it would be so much better if we all took a Jedi master that like followed us around during a workout. And when you're about to change your compensation pattern or you're going to cut your range of motion, they like whisper like, Oh, like think of the long-term goal versus like term satisfaction. <laughs> like this guru like sitting on your shoulder while you're doing all your work sets. But until we could make that like practical, 
which we're probably not going to. It's like we have to use technology to figure out how to take our own personal biases out of it. We we kind of need we kind of need AI to bounce on that quickly, Pat. We kind of need AI to be blended with GPS, say for a field sport athlete. GPS on the field, Pat. Your kind of GPS load monitors on the weights, and then Evan, the kind of SMO2 data directly, like rep to rep. You can say, okay, this rep was good, this rep was shit, and then you have kind of the fully integrated global load management package right there. You know, I think that's fair. I, I, you know, do you think there's any possibility? that the nurse stuff could get to the point where we're actually just putting people into suits. You know what I mean? Like almost like a spandex type of, uh, of, of a full body suit and that we can actually show where we're targeting and like, uh, you know, a, a board in front of you showing like which muscle is, is dropping and these, the percentages. So actually, yes, we could talk about specifics offline, but there was an organization that actually paid to do that. They literally spent tens and tens of thousands of dollars basically making a suit that had sensors on like every primary muscle group. What they ultimately found is that if you're doing like a global- Using all the damn things. Yeah, yeah, you're basically just wasting money. It's like, oh, you could have just put one on your vastus lateralis, hamstring, delt, lat, pec, and you would have gotten the exact same data. Hmm. It becomes really interesting with doing it that way. Um, Are you familiar with Neuroxon, like the little portable, um, like- EMG sensor. So basically, imagine like a spider web of mini EMG sensors that like encases a muscle. So one of the things that I've been interested in doing, um, and Ben, Ryan, and I, we did like a podcast last week and we were talking about it. Like I legitimately want to get this funded is make some kind of sleeve. So imagine you have like a sleeve on your arm and it has a few different near sensors and it has the EMG sleeve. So you could see both muscle recruitment or amplitude of EMG and you could see desaturation in the muscle. So you're looking at it from both perspectives. Like when am I utilizing O2? When is muscle activation going up or down? And this would allow us to really dial things in from like a work perspective. But the issue is one, it's expensive. So if you're going to do this, it needs to, someone needs to make money off of this somehow. So my idea for making this practical is to try and get it funded by like some kind, and I hope someone takes this idea because honestly, I just want to see it done, is imagine in like a pro sports scenario, um, like you think of like baseball, and like the biggest issues, pitchers blowing out their shoulders or getting elbow injuries. So what most teams do is they just monitor total number of pitches thrown, and that's like their point of control. But you're like, oh, it's kind of a crude measurement. Like, it doesn't really tell us what's happening in the arm. So the next step, you'd think, okay, let's look at NIRS and EMG in that arm. And you're like, okay, that's great. But what if you realize that the reason that that shoulder and elbow are being put under stress is actually the front leg is losing the ability to decelerate after a pitch. So it's actually the front leg is fatiguing, and that's causing a compensation and movement in the shoulder, and that's what's causing these different issues to happen. So if we were able to figure out, like, it would be different for every movement, but like, what is the primary and secondary muscle that you want to be monitoring? So if you're squatting, you're doing it with like your heels on a wedge and you're using a transformer bar and you want to get quads, it's like, okay, maybe we like look at like quads, hamstrings, like we look at the different primary and secondary muscles and we see like, okay, you're doing this set. Are they activating more and more? Are you desaturating more and more? And at what point are you compensating and getting activation in other muscle groups? And then you could really dial things in, but like that's so expensive that it's just never going to be practical to actually do that. Like we're literally talking for each person would probably need about 20 to 30 grand worth of sensors. Yeah. I mean, that's the problem with all like these round one levels of trying to figure out how to do things. And then 10 years later, you can buy it for nine ninety nine or something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's tricky. You know, I've, I've personally spent, uh, you know, we're, we're into six figures in terms of developing the, the measurement tech that, that I've got. And, um, you know, it's a gamble. It's like, I, I think that this will be something that people will like going forward and that it'll more than make its money back once this gets out into the world and people see how powerful it is from the perspective of, of making exercise better and for giving you really more uh, in the way of quality control and, and freedom to make training experiences uh, more interesting for people, just better guidelines. 
like I think largely the success of CrossFit is just the gamification of it. And like the reason why a lot of people you talk to them, like, how do you get into CrossFit? And they're like, well, I did bodybuilding for six years. It's boring. It's like, if you figure out that technology, you're turning, you're figuring out how to make everything into CrossFit. Mm -hmm. Like you're yeah. in machines in the gym, like a preacher bench. Now that's CrossFit because you're game, not, not literally CrossFit, but you're figuring yeah. out gamification. Now that's going to become addicting in the same way that CrossFit is addicting. Like I did CrossFit for years and for a long time, it was extremely addicting. Like I've been into like climbing and bouldering and it's very addicting, like climbing and figuring out the problem solving. Mm -hmm. I like doing like, I like lifting weights. Like I enjoy resistance training. So that's addicting for me. But for most people, it's not that enjoyable. It's boring training. So you could almost figure out how to like hack it and make that dopaminergic. And now like, Think of that from a commercial gym standpoint, like in LA Fitness, what would that be worth for their members to actually consistently show up for month after month, year after year? Yeah, no, that's, that's my play for sure. Um, but it's, it's, it's very interesting to me, the addition that you're talking about because of the specificity of it, you know? And, and look, I think specificity is always king. And no matter which way, you're always going to arrive back at specificity. And the, the ways in which specificity kind of rears its head, I always find fascinating. You know, um, in, 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 in from a biomechanics standpoint, I've always, you know, I'm more on the line of like, well, how do I know that I'm actually kind of training frontal plane tissues or transverse plane tissues or sagittal tissues? Like I need to have, uh, I, I've created sensory motor standards that I use to try to objectively say that you are in fact training these tissues, which are fundamentally different from those tissues from a, the perspective of the cardinal planes that they move through. And I, I've also tried to do that with the stances that people assume while performing exercise to say that like a bilateral stance is fundamentally different from a forward, backward, staggered stance and fundamentally different from a laggard, lateral staggered stance. And, and you know, I, 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 just to me, I don't have uh, empirical evidence to be able to support that. Uh, I don't know how someone would go about doing that, but, but ultimately I've seen enough examples of like guys that are really strong squatters that can't do a body weight split squat or something along those lines, or, you know, people that are very good athletes that can't throw a ball or swing a golf club or something like that. And it's just like, well, this is a fundamentally different thing than these other things. And, and the degree of specificity presents itself when you find something that is fundamentally different. And, and even like historically, like some of the earliest realms of exercise science in the United States were based on trying to uh, measure fitness and then being unsuccessful with actually being able to measure the totality of fitness and then finding that there's subdivisions of fitness and that certain tests are measuring the same thing as other tests Whereas if you find something distinct and different and they just use correlation to try to identify that. And like, I don't have that level of, of sophistication from a measurement standpoint in my own model to tell you whether or not something is in fact different fundamentally from something else. But, but I do think that it, I think that underneath a lot of things that, that the more that you can identify specific different things that, that, are not strongly correlated with each other. And that can take place in lifting weights. You know what I mean? Like, like it just gets all lumped into the same sort of a thing. But when you're talking about these compensatory movements during a hamstring curl, where it's like, I'm objectively looking at what is taking place at your hamstring. And if your hamstring was in fact doing more work, that this oxygen saturation level should be decreasing. That's how things work. Uh, but it's not. It's actually remaining stagnant. And as a result of that, I believe that you're now using other tissues to try to create this output. Like, uh, you know, maybe you're using muscles that turn your pelvis. Maybe you're using your gastroc. Maybe, maybe, maybe. I don't know what you're doing, but I know what you're not doing. And ultimately being able to like identify what you are or perhaps what you are not doing is just critical from the standpoint of actually being able to drive change that you are looking for. And, and to me, that's like the pursuit of science overall from the biggest to big picture standpoints, 
is to be able to pinpoint things and to be able to manipulate, control, and progress the specific things that we want to be able to target and move in a direction. Like we, it is this control dominance and ultimately ability to make exactly what we want happen take place. And you know, that's, that's where we're at, I think, in terms of this conversation. Uh, it's just all of the different tools to be able to try to accomplish that. Yeah, and I think one of the interesting things when you were talking about that guy who's like a great squatter and then maybe you throw them on like a Bulgarian split squat and you're like, you could squat 500 pounds and you can't Bulgarian split squat like 135. Like how does that possibly work? Or if the tissues are strong enough to do it, but there's something about their position that doesn't allow them to access that. And one of the things that I see that's kind of interesting is um, a lot of times you see these athletes that are like stuck in thoracic extension and usually you see that they have like tiny delts. And when you pop like a moxie on these athletes or in that thoracic extension pattern, you're like, okay, do a lateral raise and they do it. And you're like, oh, there's no desaturation occurring in your adults or it's very minimal. So then maybe you get them some like therapy they get on the training table and they restore their thoracic position. And they start doing lateral raises and you're like, damn, you're desaturating your delts. Like the position of your axial skeleton was such that you're not using those muscles. And we think about movement compensation when you're doing lateral raises and they get really hard what position do you go into compensate and get the weight up? You go into thoracic extension and try and get it up. So it's like, okay, well, we know when someone's stuck in that position, they can't use those muscles. And when those muscles are fatiguing, you go into that position to try and do more weight because you're creating a compensation pattern. So I think like in the same way that studying like pathophysiology could help us better understand physiology, like I think understanding dysfunctional mechanics helps it like what is happening in the muscles when someone is in a dysfunctional movement pattern. I know dysfunctional, like maybe it's not the best word because generally there's a reason why they're in that position. But then on the flip side, if we understand that, then we understand like what position do we actually want you to be in to get a task done. And if we can understand both sides of that coin, there's like a rehab perspective, there's a training perspective, and we can just start to flesh these concepts out. Yeah, I mean, I absolutely agree with you. Like being in a split stance versus a bilateral stance, you think of like a staggered stance RDL versus an RDL. Like in theory, they shouldn't really be that different, but I think it's probably likely that they're pretty different. And maybe for a given person, one of those is a way more effective exercise than the other. And maybe we don't know why that's the case, but there is some underlying reason for it. <laughs> We're just trying to figure out the reasons and then trying to figure out systems to kind of offload our thinking because ultimately in training, like we want to be like dumb athletes, like just go in, put your head down, get the work done. And we have to use so much cognitive oversight to make sure that we're not screwing things up. But if we could offload that thinking to a machine or an algorithm where all that you need to focus on is just going in and getting the work done. Like, I think that's going to lead to more meaningful performance outcomes when you don't need to be cognitively managing all these little micro details in your session. Like, oh, am I desaturating this muscle? Am I getting compensation? It's like, no, just go do the squat. And if you mess it up, the machine will tell you you mess it up and then you just have to fix it and then go do it again. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And it's funny because a lot of the times I, you know, it's funny if you do enough presentations, then you get feedback from audiences. And when you get feedback from audiences, they kind of tell you what they learned from it or what they took away from it. And oftentimes I'm like, that's what you think you heard? Like, I, I don't understand like, like how you organized and created the hierarchy of things that seem to be important from what I said, as far as what you synthesized and took away from this. Because that's not the critical thing. Like you focused on the minutia and didn't take away like the most important thing. And, and when I'm talking about trying to create sensory motor competency for determining whether or not like you know you're in the right position to be able to execute movements it's like why do i want to create a sagittal plane sensory motor competent position and and the reason that i want to do that is because i'm looking to standardize the axial skeleton and if i standardize the axial skeleton it increases the probability that the tissue that I'm trying to target as my prime mover ends up being the tissue that I actually targeted. Because what I'm like from a biggest of big picture standpoint of what I prioritize from training 
is that I want to drive the adaptation that I'm looking for with the fewest number of secondary side effects that could come along for the ride. And like side effects are fatigue or soreness or inflammation. Like those are not the objectives that I'm trying to accomplish, but oftentimes they're the side effect of the administration of the stimulus that I'm giving the person. So if I can provide equal amount of stimulus and reduce the side effects, I think that I've made a better product overall, not only just from it being better in terms of like you have less problems as a result of it that you don't like, but I think I can probably enhance the overall ceiling of how much stimulus I could provide you from a long-term career perspective, uh, which should in theory drive more total adaptation and provide for greater potential physical output. Uh, but to me, it's like, you know, exercise is medicine is this tagline of the ACSM. And I think it's an intelligent tagline. I like where it's going. Uh, but to me, medicine is the ability to effectively identify the appropriate dosage of the right stimulus that you're providing the organism. And the stimulus itself has changed over time within medicine. You know, you start off with dumb drugs in many ways. And dumb drugs are just simply drugs that provide the like they give you the stimulus that you're looking for to tackle the problem that you came in with unfortunately they don't just target the one target tissue they end up binding to receptors on many different types of tissues throughout the body and as the history and evolution of drugs takes place the drugs themselves are made so that they bind to fewer tissue types that aren't the target tissue and ultimately, hopefully, you get to the point where you've made a very smart drug and it only binds to the target tissue and it reduces the, the secondary uh, effects that are undesirable. And to me, exercise should go the same way, where if I'm smart about how I program exercise, I should actually be trying to identify uh, exercises themselves that are smarter exercises that don't necessarily recruit many side tissues that are not the intended tissue because now i'm just you know and and i'm not just talking about muscles but like connective tissues and the skeleton and 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 other pieces that are like not the primary objective that i'm looking for here and and again it just comes down to specificity and and intelligence and boy would i love to be able to have uh some piece of equipment that could just notify the person uh immediately to identify like eh, that rep was 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 now outside the window of positionally where you need to be to be able to actually recruit the target tissues that we've identified for this drill. I mean, that would be incredible. Yeah. Not much to uh, add there. That would be, <laughs> you can figure that out. I just enjoyed listening to that side tangent. So let's transition to some uh, Instagram questions, Ryan, specifically on hypertrophy. So Ryan asks, it's a three-part question. One, how to determine minimum effective dose or volume for hypertrophy. Number two, are deloads necessary when doing a hypertrophy-focused cycle? So let's say eight or 12 weeks. And then uh, third part, how should going to failure be used in the context of hypertrophy training? Yeah, I'll tackle those. So um, how to determine if minimum effective dose for hypertrophy. So one, has overload occurred in some capacity? Have you gotten stronger or bigger? If so, you've at least done enough work to make progress. I think if we're like trying to figure out the low end of what that takes, like are you getting pumps within a session? Is the muscle fatigued? Is there any tension in the muscle later in the day? Like if none of those things occurred, like if I go in right now and I go do one set of bicep curls, finish the day, like I'm not really gonna get a pump. My muscle's not gonna feel fatigued. I'm not gonna feel tension. But there's going to be some low end cutoff where that occurs. But figuring out minimum effective dose, it's not really that practical because what if I figure out how it takes five sets for me to get progressive overload week to week? Am I then going to go see, oh, do I get progressive overload with four? And because it's a moving target, you're never really going to figure that out. I think it's much easier to figure out what the most volume you could do and still make progress is. But that low end, I think minimum effective volume is a really nice concept, but it's just not practical and something we could really make useful. Yeah, I think that you have to start playing in these subjective appraisal realms that, that you know, whether or not they, they actually are perfect. Like, you're always like, this is a proxy for what I think is happening uh, 
you know, at the level of the cell for actually driving hypertrophy. And, and I suppose like experiencing a pump is the closest proxy that we have like in a training session as to whether or not it's an environment that's going to support hypertrophy. So like, you know, if you're, if you're really on a hypocaloric diet, like you can do a, a horrendously hard workout and it's hard to get any kind of a pump, you know, versus if you've been on vacation and you're just crushing the buffet, uh, you do like one set that wasn't even close to failure and you feel like your skin's going to pop. Uh, and you're probably, so it's, it's kind of like these proxy things are probably associated with whether or not you're in the right environment to be able to create the adaptations that you want. Uh, and I think the pump is that. And, and so it's like minimum effective, you know, volume or dosage, it's gotta be effective. And, and I think that there's just, there's like a lot of ex outside factors that are beyond just the loading parameters that we're talking about there that would determine whether or not it's effective. Like I was just talking about from a nutrition standpoint, like if your goal is hypertrophy and you are on a hypocaloric diet, severely hypocaloric, uh, there may not be any effective volume. Like you probably just aren't set up in the right way for it to actually qualify as, as the E in the MED uh, or MEV uh, initialization. So it, it just, it's like, it's one of these uh, moving target sorts of deals where if you're doing, if you just, you know, if you're on like quarantine lifestyle and you're just sleeping a ton and you're just eating a ton, then it takes very little training volume to be able to create a, a stimulus that you maybe find effective. To me, it's just like, let's look at it from like the big picture standpoint and let's compare training block to training block and is the current training block you're in, is it slightly better than the previous training block? Uh, if it is, then you're probably going in the right direction. And how do I construct it? You know, sort of like this second question dovetailing in about deloads and all that sort of stuff. You know, like you have to be, you have a lot of subsystems that need to be in place to be able to have an effective training block, including your psychological system. And sometimes that psychology just needs a bit of a break, get away from it for a second and then come back in and then just analyze your previous training block, take a look at where you started in that block, start in a similar place, just ever so slightly higher, and progress appropriately. But the end of the training block clearly and obviously needs to be more volume than the beginning of the training block. And that's just kind of how you organize it. And maybe you start off with fairly, you know, you, you think you can predict numerically where you're gonna start and how you're gonna get to the end and put all the steps in between there. And maybe you find that as you start this block, like you're like, oh, I totally overshot. And I'm, there's no way that this is going to be supportive of uh, being able to make the kinds of, of changes that I want. But, but overall, my answer is, is basically that um, people, from, people, I just think the big problem is that people have, a, they're, they're too limited in terms of their scope of looking at time. And, and it's like, I don't care that much about today's training session. I, like what I'm interested in is, is the whole block itself slightly more than the previous whole block itself? Is this month better than last year's same month? Is this three month chunk better than last year's three month chunk at the same time? Is this year slightly better than last year? You know, and, and oftentimes like you can, you can derail your month, your months and your year by doing stupid things like getting hurt or getting sick or something like that. And it's like, oh, well, you know, you hurt yourself and now you are unable to exercise in totality for two weeks. And now it takes like four weeks of rehab work to get back to the point where you're exercising at a decent level. But then it takes another four weeks to get back to the point where you're at the same level you were at before you got hurt. And then it takes another two weeks to be able to get above and beyond where you were way back 12 weeks ago or whatever before you hurt yourself. And now if I look at it from like a 55 week standpoint and you just lost 12 weeks, well, you lost like 20% of your training year from an effective component of how much dose you need to actually make progress. So the deload question is, yes, you probably need to deload, but not for the reason that you think might be the, the answer that you're looking for. You, you need it to, to sort of prevent yourself from, from losing your biggest of big picture progressions 
All right, guys, for those that are not uh, looking at the video, Pat had to leave us because he has a busy day ahead of him. Thanks so much, Pat, for coming on. It was an absolute pleasure. So, Evan, we're going to continue with some questions. So we had the, the third part of Ryan's question, which was, how should going to failure be used in the context of hypertrophy? Yeah, so I think, one, it makes sense to define failure. Like, there's objective versus subjective failure. So someone pushing to, like, volitional failure, which – someone that might mean five to ten reps left in the tank depending on who they are or true failure like you cannot contract this muscle any longer and keep going so i think if hypertrophy is the main training goal we know that proximity to failure is extremely important but it looks like there's this s-shaped curve where if you leave five reps in the tank versus ten reps in the tank that set with five reps in reserve is much more effective than ten reps in reserve and then three reps in the tank versus five is more effective two reps is more effective than three but once you start getting lower and lower, there's less and less of a difference. So one rep in the tank versus two reps in the tank, it's not really going to be that different from a like true adaptation standpoint. Then leaving one true rep in the tank versus going to complete failure, it's not going to be much more effective. And then going past failure, having someone like pick up the weight, it's not that much more effective. So I think if someone's primary goal is hypertrophy, if they're leaving one to two reps in reserve, and that isn't legitimately leaving that many reps in the tank, that's probably going to be the nice sweet spot where if they're going to complete failure, it's like it just drives more fatigue. and It's not that much more productive. And then anything higher than that, you're just leaving like room left on the table. At that point, most people are going to want to do more work sets. And it's like, well, why add more work sets to your training week when you're leaving five reps in the tank on all your work sets? So I think it just is like how close to failure is close enough in the same way that how heavy is heavy enough. And then once you hit that sweet spot, then you're looking at total work sets is the next point of control that we'd be going after. Yeah. So maybe to, to bounce right back on that and go to the kind of the opposite of the first question that was asked, how, how do you determine maximum productive volume for hypertrophy? Maybe without nears that would indicate at some point you can't desaturate the muscle, you're compensating, you should probably stop there. How do you, can you do that without that technology? So within a single session, it would be really hard to parse that out without years. But if we're looking at over the course of like training week, I think you could more reliably figure that out. If you're doing, and this is like local muscle volume, if we are doing like too much volume for your biceps, for example, you will locally overtrain that muscle. So even if you're not systemically overtrained, if that muscle is locally overtrained, that muscle won't be making training progress. So you're not going to add load to whatever exercises you're doing. You're not going to add reps across sets. And then you know you've locally overtrained, which that kind of follows up on that deload question. Like you could locally deload someone or you could systemically deload someone. A local deload might just mean that that specific muscle has crossed its max recoverable volume, but your overall body hasn't. So I think you could kind of parse it out that way, but it would be extremely difficult to say like in this single session, you could do eight sets of bicep curls before no more work is productive. I think like the pump would be the best proxy for that. Like once you can't get a good pump and contraction the muscle, you're probably not doing anything productive, but I don't think we could like pinpoint it the same way that you could if you were using technology. Right. So moving on to the next question, more geared towards uh, kind of field sport athletes, Hugo and Matthias asked something similar. So I'm going to kind of blend them together. What's the best way to program hypertrophy in season for a rugby athlete, or let's say a field sport athlete who needs to gain muscle mass without negatively impacting his athletic performance? Yeah. So I think for doing it for, and I mean, rugby is a different scenario because there's like the mechanical padding aspect of muscle, but I think the best way to do it is going to be context specific, like hypertrophy is a non-specific training adaptation, which means there's a lot of different ways that we could go about it. So for that person, what is the least disruptive thing to their training week? So if we're using like very heavy loads and doing hypertrophy training, well, you're going to put more stress on the joints and connective tissue. That might be disruptive. If you're training very light loads and pushing those to failure, that's going to create a lot of fatigue. So that's probably going to be disruptive. So I think we're thinking about more of a conservative approach to hypertrophy training, kind of that proxy that Pat was giving, maybe that like eight to 15 rep range is probably going to be the least fatiguing or the least damaging on the joints and connective tissue. But then if we're thinking about it not impacting sports performance, that becomes an entirely different thing. So like for all of that muscle that you put on, you're going to have to ventilate that tissue. You're going to have to clear more CO2. It's possible that gaining that muscle will make you occlude easier. 
So I think for that person, they'll probably want to try and put on muscle and improve cardiac output simultaneously. So it's not coming with any negative impacts on their sport performance. Do you have any uh, experience using cluster sets for hypertrophy for, for athletes? Yeah, I've used them. One of the things that you do see in the hypertrophy training literature is that on a set per set basis, they might not be like as effective. So if we had one group do like five sets of 10 and the other group does five sets of like a 5.5 cluster, that group will get less total hypertrophy. But oftentimes they do have better strength outcomes. So it kind of depends on like, is the reason that they want to gain muscle mass? They just want to get stronger. And if that's the reason, maybe we could get them stronger without even having them gain muscle. So I think we could kind of parse that out and create nuance based on why the person wants to gain muscle and what the context of their ref, the rest of their training plan is. Then Dylan asks, I guess that goes back to the reps and reserve kind of answer, but number one, what is the ideal RPE for hypertrophy training? And then, uh, yeah, and I guess you talked about this previously, but quickly touch on it, how to determine effective intensity for, for hypertrophy. Yeah, so the reason that I don't necessarily like using RP in a lot of cases, like I'd rather use reps and reserve. So in my mind, we would figure out an effective intensity for someone, and then we would tell them how many reps and reserve to push at that load, because RPE is so variable. One of uh, Pat and I have a mutual friend, Ryan Lecure, he's a natural, professional natural bodybuilder. And one of the things that he's talked about a lot is throughout the year he'll do these like work capacity blocks and he always talks about these don't actually do anything productive for him for hypertrophy but every time he does those work capacity blocks when he goes back to his hypertrophy training he's like everything feels so easy in comparison like even pushing a heavy set of squats to failure he's like it's just not as bad anymore because it lowers the perceived exertion because you think about it like hypertrophy training it's nothing like a 60 second assault bike sprint so I think if we were to use RPE, I think that could kind of skew things because you get like a CrossFit athlete and they want to transition into doing hypertrophy work. Everything they do in like the hypertrophy world is going to have such low relative RPEs for them or someone who's less trained. Like you might have them do a set of preacher curls to failure and they're like, oh, my bicep, I'm going to die. Like the RPEs are just very high. So I think it would be difficult to say like an ideal RP because it's like, well, I don't know you. Like if I knew the person, maybe I could say what an ideal RPE is. Like someone like Pat who trains really hard, for him, like a seven RPE might be good because if he does a nine, he's probably going to end up like bleeding out of some orifice. But like if a beginner does that and you're like, seven RPE, they might leave 15 reps in the tank. So it's really hard to give like a great answer for that, which I know kind of sucks, but. Oh, so reps in reserve is better. Could be the answer. <laughs> uh, Mikolai asks, one, how does lifting tempo and load affect hypertrophy? Uh, so he gives an example, like a tempo of 4040 at 40% 1RM versus 40X0 above 80%. So maybe we can tackle that and go into the the follow-up questions after yeah so i think this this example is kind of skewed because like a 4040 tempo at 40 percent is probably going to lead to a lot less hypertrophy than a 40x so at 80 percent of a one rep max just because you're probably going to not fail due to peripheral muscle fatigue on that 4040 at 40 percent like just looking at that right now i'm like god i could probably do like 70 reps on that <laughs> um but if we we're talking about like somewhat equal load, so when we're using these like very slow tempos versus like a faster tempo, which I think the question kind of boils down to, right. um, when you look at the literature, it looks like neither really makes that much of a difference. As long as a rep takes between about two and 10 seconds, neither is going to create more total hypertrophy. What it really changes is what part of the muscle hypertrophies so if we're doing these like very slow eccentrics and taking a set to failure, um, or if we're doing like a faster eccentric and more of a concentric bias lift, the muscle will grow the same. But if we're doing eccentrically overloaded training, the way that the muscle is going to grow is that we're going to lengthen the fascicles. So the fascicles, like the bundle of skeletal muscle fibers. And if you think the origin and insertion of a muscle are going to be in the same place, no matter what. So if you lengthen a muscle fiber and it's inserting in the same two places, it's going to make the muscle look bigger because now it's going to have to take a bigger path to get there. Where if we're doing those concentric bias lifts, we're going to widen the fascicles. So the origin and insertion are going to be the same. We're not lengthening the muscle, but we're making it wider. 
So we're just hypertrophying different parts of the muscle based on the speed of the rep and what part of that um, muscle contraction is emphasized. So would there be a specific tempo used for a certain hypertrophy outcome that we're looking for and then another one? Yeah, so it, it, the thing is like, unless you're in a lab setting, you don't really have a good way of knowing if you need more length or width on a muscle fiber. Like if I'm like, oh, Sean, like you've just created a shit ton of length with all the training you've done, <laughs> you should really buy spastical width. Like we can't really do that. So I think a good way to think about it would be make sure all of your reps are between like two and 10 seconds and probably sparse it out. Like most training, you probably want to do the pretty natural tempo, like use a fast concentric under control, lower it down under control. And you probably don't need to worry about super slow eccentrics. But if you're doing a lot of volume, it might be worth using different tempos. So if you're doing 20 sets of bicep curls a week, probably do some with a natural tempo, do some with slow eccentrics. And then you can make sure that you're hypertrophying the different parts of the muscle. But I don't think there is like a scientific breakdown that we'd say like, oh, 20% is eccentric bias, 40% is concentric, that type of thing. Okay, so part two of the question, how to hypertrophy slow twitch muscle fibers. Uh, that's a, a concept I came across I think it was in Joel Jameson's book, uh, Ultimate uh, MMA Conditioning, which kind of gave me the foundation uh, for all things energy systems that you very kindly ruined recently with your work. <laughs> I'd say that in the best of ways, honestly, but it did ruin half of what I knew. So I just have to, to digest that and move forward. Uh, is, there, is there a way to hypertrophy the slow twitch fibers and what would the effect be on, say, performance? Yeah, hopefully I don't ruin your... Um, thoughts on hypertrophy and slow twitch fibers. <laughs> um, in recent years, I haven't looked a ton into this, but I know when I was reading a lot of like Victor Solyanov's work, he talks about slow twitch hypertrophy a lot. And that protocol that um, the guy gave in the last example, that 40400, that's probably something that will be a good slow twitch hypertrophy protocol. So if we're using squats, for example, one of the things that we know is a rapid change of direction is going to shift us to using more fast twitch fibers. So we probably want to go through a limited range of motion, keeping the muscle under tension the entire time with slow, eccentric, and concentric, and no rapid changes of direction. So if I was doing like a slow twitch fiber hypertrophy protocol for my quads, I might do like four seconds down from a near standing position to right above parallel on a squat, then come back up slowly and stop right above lockout. So you're basically um fatiguing primarily the slow twitch fibers you need to be using a light load doing that as well i have done a lot of those protocols in the past and i have to say they feel extremely weird like once you start fatiguing enough when you're getting closer to failure it's not a normal muscle failure you feel like it almost feels like individual fibers in your legs you're like twitching and like getting tetanus it's a really bizarre phenomenon so i think that could potentially be a way to hypertrophy slow twitch fibers that being said, I haven't looked at a muscle biopsy to know if that actually works. But I think in theory, um, what a lot of middle distance coaches in track and field try and do is creating an athlete with large slow twitch fibers. Because if you think about it, if you have the same top speed as me when we're sprinting, and you get that top speed by hypertrophying your fast twitch fibers, and I get that same level of force generation by hypertrophying my slow twitch fibers, guess which one of us is going to sustain that effort for a longer period of time? Mm -hmm. It's going to be me. So in theory, if you want like a 355 miler, you probably want them to have giant slow twitch fibers because a 355 miles moving at a pretty good clip, but sustaining it pretty easily for at least the first 400 to 800 meters. So I think that's probably where the rubber would meet the road on that. So there would be a potential performance benefit for middle to long distance athletes, let's say? Yeah, I think it's possible. I, I don't know if there's good literature on that for me to make like a solid like that will improve performance, but I think it's definitely possible that that could be the case. Right. Third part of the question, how to minimize hypertrophy and maximize strength gains. You talked a little bit about clusters, uh, cluster sets in that, in that regard. Is there other ways to, to do that? Yeah, um, do as little volume as possible to gain strength. So you're basically making sure you're not leveraging volume to get hypertrophy. And I think a really good way to do it is leverage like heavy singles. A big part of absolute strength is um, it's skill. So if you're doing like a lot of heavy singles, heavy doubles and things like that, you're going to tap out your ceiling of strength with the muscle mass that you have. 
but at some point to get stronger, you'll need to get muscle. So I think what this comes down to is like, you can maximize the amount of strength relative to your amount of muscle mass by using these strategies, but you're going to be constrained by your total amount of muscle at some period in time. Brandon asks, is it necessary for a natural lifter to lift like a power lifter in order to gain muscle mass? Maybe that goes back to the, kind of the hormone hypothesis, hypothesis you were talking about. Yeah. So if we're talking about like this idea that, I used to hear it all the time when I first started training. Like, if you want to put an inch on your biceps, put 20 pounds on your squat. And you're like, what? How does that work? Um, so my short answer is definitely um, not. I actually think if you're a natural lifter and your only goal is to gain muscle and you don't necessarily care about your big three lifts numbers, you probably don't want to train like a power lifter um, because this is where we're getting into that idea. And it's what Pat was talking about. It's... Um, performance outcome driven movement versus adaptation driven movement so if i'm trying to move the most load as humanly possible i'm going to default to compensation patterns to get that done but if i want to grow a muscle as much as i humanly can i'm going to want to isolate it and by virtue of that i'm not going to be going into the gym with the goal of just moving as much load i'm going to be thinking about range of motion not compensating all these different things that come into it so um short answer is no you don't need to train like a power lifter to gain muscle mass all right, I'll, we'll get the last question in. Um, we talked uh, quite broadly about the nutritional requirements for hypertrophy. What are your, the main guidelines that you give to your athletes when their objective is to, to put on mass? Yeah, so based on most of the literature, it really only looks like you need as little. Previously, they'd say, oh, if you want to gain muscle, you need like uh, 3,500 calories surplus in a week. In reality, it looks like something as small as a 50 calorie surplus per day is enough to gain muscle. But the issue is energy flux on a day-to-day -day basis. Like if you're just trying to give yourself a 50 calorie surplus, like you're going to wash that out in like two days. So I think practically speaking for a very advanced athlete, you're probably only looking at like a 200 to 300 calorie surplus in a day. Um, and that's going to be effective enough to gain muscle mass on the high end. Maybe you would go into like a 500 calorie surplus per day, but it's definitely not required. Like just, not being isocoric or hypocoric hypo is going to be important. But as long as you're hypercoric, no matter what that surplus is, it is going to allow you to gain muscle mass. And then we're kind of picking hairs with how hypercoric you need to be. So I would probably shoot like 200, 250 calories above maintenance, which you would find by um, figure out the most amount of food you could eat without gaining weight and then add like 250 calories on top of that. And that's probably going to cover most people's needs. Do you go deeper into protein ratios and stuff like that, or do you not even bother? Honestly, I don't even bother. Like, I think when we're getting into the minutia, we're just dealing with these like very small effect size hammers where it's like, okay, you're in a hyper hypercork state and it's like you have a big hammer and you just smash it. And it's like, we don't need these tiny little hammers to chip away. So I think as long as you're getting enough protein, um, you check that box, anything above that's not going to be more productive. And the more advanced an athlete you are, and the more is it's actually the less protein you need because you get less protein breakdown when you're a very advanced athlete. So for people who have been lifting for like 10 years and are trying to gain muscle, they probably don't need a nitpick. And when you're in a hypercaloric state, you actually don't need as much protein either. So if you're even getting like 0.9 grams per pound of body mass or 0.8 grams per pound of body mass, you're probably eating more than enough protein. Fantastic, Ben. Well, let's, uh, let's close on that. It was a pleasure to have you on again, along with Pat. I think it was a really productive conversation. Uh, yeah, that was a great talk. I really enjoyed that. So hopefully we can do that again sometime. Absolutely. Take care. All right, take it easy, man.